Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name's Paul Ryan. I'm going to be the facilitator and presenter for today. Um, I'm going to start right on time. So, a, a very warm welcome to you if you're joining us again after last week, and, and a warm welcome if you're just um, this is your first session. Before we get into any detail, can I ask people to people that are joining to please mute yourself and preferably turn off your video. We don't need your video coming in, um, and that way we can we can minimise the the load on the the bandwidth in each direction. Um, I'll get into some detail in a minute, but before I do, I want to hand over to Ashley Rogers from the Goulburn Broken Catchment Management Authority to welcome us and to acknowledge the country. So I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Ash. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, apologies to those that heard my introduction last week, but we've um, got a lot of new people joining us today as well. So I'll be um, just recapping a couple of things. Um, so just on the behalf of the Golden Broken Catchment Management Authority, we're really pleased to be working with Paul and the Australian Resilience Centre to bring you this webinar series. We've been overwhelmed with the level of interest. We've now had a, over 180 people register um, for the five sessions or a combination of the five sessions. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional yeah, owners of yeah, the Golden sorry. Broken Catchment, the Tangarong and Yorta Yorta people, as well as the traditional owners of the lands from where you're all calling from today um, and their unique connection to country. I'd also like to acknowledge the Victorian Government's Our Catchments, Our Communities program and the Golden Broken CMA for sponsoring this webinar series. You may be wondering why is the Golden Broken CMA interested in resilience? Um, we've been actually um, working with resilience principles and thinking to guide our strategic planning and approach to natural resource management since 2005. We'll be talking more about it in the final session, but to give you a little bit of a brief overview, we're currently renewing the Golden Broken Regional Catchment Strategy. This six year strategy guides actions to improve and protect the catchment's natural resources, that's the land, biodiversity and community water resources and looking after these precious um, resources underpins the social, cultural, economic well-being of the diverse um, people and communities that make up the catchment. So resilience thinking underpins this strategy. Uncertainty and change, which Paul will be talking more about today. Um, the strategy is not just for the CMA, it's for all groups, organisations and landholders involved in natural resource management. Um, so we'll be working closely with all of these stakeholders, which no doubt includes a lot of you um, joining us today to co-design the strategy. Uh, we're also um, really strongly support building the capacity of individuals, groups and organisations um, within the catchment and more broadly Victoria and nationally. Um, we've got people from all over the country joining this webinar series um, to build their skills and apply resilience in their own work. Um, so that's another reason why we're hosting um, this webinar series and have made it available to everyone. So that's all from me for now, um, but thanks again for participating and I'll hand back over to you, Paul. Thanks, Ash. So um, this is one of the second in a series of five uh, webinars on resilience. And last week we started with a pretty general kind of discussion overview about some definitions of resilience. And we talked about uh, psychological resilience, personal resilience, um, community resilience, disaster resilience. But the area that we really want to focus on and the area that the Goulburn Broken Catch Management Authority have been um, using, the, the concept they've been using is this idea of social ecological system resilience. It's a bit of jargon, social ecological system resilience. What it really means is about the connection between people and place. And that's where we're going to focus in today. We're going to dig into that and we're going to get right to the sort of core of the key uh, resilience thinking and management kind of ideas that come together to help us think about this. Before we do that, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, the same caveat supply as last week. I'm coming to you live from the shed in COVID lockdown. We've got four kids inside homeschooling, so I'm out in the man cave. Um, we might get a bit of background noise. Uh, the rubbish truck's due at any time, so we'll just keep that. We'll 
uh, in mind. We'll do what we need to do if that happens. Um, last week, we had some technology issues about video, so we've switched our approach. So hopefully that will deal with most of those issues in terms of the video. The chat issue, so a number of people couldn't, um, about 20% of people couldn't use the chat function, and we don't know why that is. Aaron Finlay at the Goulburn Broken Catchment Management Authority, the IT manager there, has worked hard on that all week to try and resolve that, and we haven't been able to resolve that, so we really apologise. He's contacted Microsoft to query why that would be, and we hopefully we'll get a response soon about that. If this week you can't use the chat, and you want to ask a question, um, there's a few options. One is you can interject, um, you put your audio on, put your microphone on and interject if you need to do that, if you really feel you need to do that. Um, if you can wait till it's an appropriate time, there will be a little question time towards the end. You could also email it to, to Ashley, you've all got her email address, so if you need to, you could email a question to her. You can also just um, email questions after if, you, if you'd like, um, more detail or anything like that, not either myself or Ash are happy to, to help out. Um, we did a little survey last week and we'll do that again, um, but the feedback was really fantastic and, and um, really important for helping to shape the way we want to think about these sessions. And so we're going to do that again and I'd please just ask you, it only takes a few minutes and it's really important. It's good feedback for us. It helps us to structure the future sessions. What that feedback told us was that the timing and the structure of the session was about right, so we're going to stick with that. Um, overwhelmingly, about 85 and 90 percent of people were happy with that kind of structure, the timing and structure. There was some requested content, um, and I've lumped these together. There's two that are very similar, this idea about engaging with community around resilience and ideas around that, and then about applying resilience at the local community level, and I'll deal with those in a bit more detail, particularly in weeks four and five, um, and, and we'll talk about a whole range of tools and different um, practices that you can use to engage people in thinking about resilience. Um, people mentioned more case studies, and, and I'll start to, to weave that in more from this week and, and build that over the next few weeks. And then finally, there was some queries around measuring resilience, and I'll, I'm really only gonna touch on that and present some minimal content on measuring resilience. It's quite a, complex specialised area um, and you know we could spend the whole five sessions just talking about measuring resilience. What I'd like to do is to just sort of I guess point to some things that are available but if anyone's got really you know specific questions about it I'm happy to talk about it offline because it is a, a more detailed discussion. Okay so we're going to jump straight into some content and we talked about this definition of resilience as one of the last things um, as we worked through last week. And this definition, the resilience, that resilience is the capacity of a system to cope with change and continue to develop in a desired way. I've been doing this for a long time and I continue to go back to this definition and I usually start all of my work, all of my sessions, workshops, seminars, by using this definition because it actually guides you in what you need to think about and do when you're thinking about resilience work. So we're going to use this as the main structure today and I'm going to dig into these bits, uh, the words here in, in um, different colours because it actually provides us with the core elements, these core central ideas that are really important for thinking about resilience, um, practice and management. <clears throat> So the first thing to note, um, and we talked about, touched on this last week, is the idea that resilience is a systems idea. So uh, that's that's easy to say, but it's a fundamentally uh, it's a fundamental important building block for thinking about and working with this resilience concept. So what do we mean by a system? Um, if we just think about uh, you know a landscape, so this is up here in God's own country in the beautiful northeast. Uh, probably should have used the Golden Broken given that they're the hosts of this, but um, I'm a bit parochial now. Um, when we look at a landscape like this, <clears throat> um, it's easy to kind of see the colours and the pattern, but, but actually what's laying underneath that, think of it like a fabric if you like. So when you see a fabric you might see the colour or the pattern of the fabric, but 
actually underneath it's the weave the 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 detail the um the interaction the woven interaction between the social system the ecological system the economic system the cultural system all of those things that interweave and interlock uh, the institutions the laws all of that sort of you know um, stuff that makes up our world our society is all interwoven interlocked and it lays over and under these landscapes so we can think about the resilience of a system um, and when we do we need to think about that that underlying fabric that weaving uh, together those interdependencies interlocking um, dimensions of social environmental economic <clears throat> and so we use the shorthand people in place um, the technical kind of framing here is social ecological system and in that social part of that that includes the economic system the institutional the laws the rules etc uh, culture all of those things so it's shorthand social ecological system um, but we kind of you know the, the word we use when we're communicating with people on the ground and with communities is just people in place when we're thinking about this it's important to think about the fact that we we, we can think about social ecological systems at different scales and so we might think about it at this regional level we might think about it about our town our land care group our um, sub catchment right down to a a, um, a a farm and all of those are social ecological systems they have a social uh, component they have an ecological component and they interact so this idea of a system it's about the interdependencies i mentioned the idea last week about it, it's a particular technical type of social ecological system we talk about which is complex adaptive systems and that just means that they change and evolve in in particular ways and i can go into that in more detail if people want but it's a sort of fundamental idea that sitting under this under what we see around us is this um, these interacting systems and they occur at different scales so when we're trying to understand resilience, we need to have one eye on the fact that we're dealing with a system and it's a social ecological system. And if we go even deeper than that, it's a complex adaptive system. It's got particular dynamics to it. The other important thing to note here when we look at this definition is about change and understanding change and framing change is really fundamental and important um, kind of process when thinking about resilience. So change, uh, I think about change using this kind of approach. Um, so we've got two axes here and uh, on the horizontal axis, we've got certainty. So when we think about the future and we think about events that might happen, some of them we can anticipate, they're anticipated events. And you know, that's, we know, for example, that we're likely to have uh, droughts in the future, we're likely to have bushfires, we're likely to have floods, we're likely to have, um, an economic downturn, we know we'll have price fluctuations, all sorts of things. But some things are, are much harder to anticipate. They, they can be unanticipated, or we do, might not be able to anticipate exactly when or the magnitude of it. So we can think about change from that perspective. And then we can also think about change from the type of impact that it has on the system that we're interested in. And, and that impact can range from being very destructive, you know, bushfires, global pandemics, through to things that actually create opportunities and even within those destructive kind of events there are opportunities and not all parts of the system will be impacted in the same way um, you know the the pandemic has has had a massive impact on a whole range of businesses and but other businesses have actually thrived and and there's lots of little examples of that where um, people have taken opportunities and created new um, uh, you know, business opportunities in in this period of lockdown. At the moment, I just want to raise the point there about that circle that um, I, I think this is where our kind of current view of resilience building is. We're mostly dealing with things that we can anticipate. So we're worried about, you know, being resilient to bushfires or, or drought or to, um, you know, economic down. things that um, destroy issues that we care about or um, values that we we care about 
I want to make the argument um, over the next few weeks that we really should be trying to move that circle to the centre of that cross where we're starting to think much more about unanticipated and we're starting to think much more about creative uh, opportunities. And so that this idea that we touched on at the end of last week, that resilience is not just about bouncing back. Resilience is also about bouncing forward or bouncing to new uh, and creating new opportunities. And so I really want to just um, over the next few weeks start to talk about how we might do that and think about how we might move that circle towards that uh, more towards the centre of this diagram. So understanding change and how change happens and our what I call our posture towards change. Are we anticipating are we waiting to see what happens? Are we being proactive? Are we being reactive? Are we focusing more on things that destroy um, and an impact on on in negatively on on values that we care about? Or are we more interested in how we can drive towards more creative um, outcomes from whenever we suffer any kind of stress or impact? There's a number of kind of human biases and things that kick in that force us down into this corner. So we we crave certainty, we have, um, a, you know, a sort of bias towards trying to protect against losses, uh, and we have a bias against negative, um, having a negative uh, view of the future, those sorts of things. And so there's some kind of human, um, human nature sort of um, things that kick in here that drive us down into this part of the spectrum, but we can actually um, through, you know, being uh, deliberate about our thinking, sort of push ourselves more towards the centre of this diagram. Okay, so that's thinking about change. So whenever we, you know, go to a place when we want to think about resilience, we want to work with people or people in those places want to, to think about resilience, there's two key things that we need to do for a start. One is to think about the system What's the nature of this system? What's the right scale or level to be thinking about this system? And what's the nature of change in that system? And so next week I'll, I'll go into some tools that we can use to do both of those things fairly quickly with communities to understand the nature of the system that, that's there and that what people care about and value in that system and the nature of the changes that that system might experience over time. But we also need to think about this idea of the capacity and the capacity of a system. And, and I, you know, immediately want to make the point that it's not, there's not a single capacity, uh, you know, resilience is a multifaceted or multidimensional kind of capacity. And there's, there's lots of capacities built in that we need to think about. The way I've been trying to think about this, and I'll, I'll explain this diagram, this is something that I'm just working on at the moment. and and you'll see different versions of this sort of thing around. But on the left hand side, we have a, a an axis there that talks about stress. So some kind of measure of stress that that the community or an individual or a whole system might might suffer. If we just look at the dark green area for a start, as that as a, an event happens, something happens in that system. Uh, obviously, the stress starts to rise. And it'll go through a kind of, you know, it'll peak in the middle of the sort of the, the peak of the crisis, if you like, and then it'll start to taper off. An important point here is that we never go back to normal. We never go, you know, we never go back to where we were. And again, this is reinforcing that point that resilience is not just about bouncing back. The simple fact that you've suffered and experienced this kind of stress to the system means that you're never actually going back to um, where you were before. And there's evidence now that, in fact, we're kind of sore toothing up in terms of system stress that, that we're experiencing. We're never going back to the base level. You know, when people are talking about this sort of new normal type idea. Across the bottom there are um, a set of capacities that I'd, I'd call these kind of critical resilience capacities. And so you need the capacity to anticipate that something, some event might happen. Um, and I talked about anticipated and unanticipated, and, I, and I'll, I'll cover the unanticipated stuff in a little bit later on. But you, for those things that we can anticipate, we know that there's strategies we can put in place. We know that there's things that we can do. So think about, you know, how much improved our climate forecasting is. Think about the app that we have on our phone that can tell us when a bad fire day is predicted. 
think about the improvement in things like um, you know flood uh, warning systems all of those sort of systems that can help us to um, understand what could happen and to anticipate it we then need some capacity to absorb so we're not going to be able to avoid some of these sort of stresses and impacts that happen to our communities so we need some capacity to absorb and that could be sort of in a really simple way like you know the physical capacity to absorb so maintaining floodplains that allow rivers to flood out uh, and and maintaining wetlands and things like that that you know provide a free service to us by absorbing that flood impact but it could also be having um, cash reserves so we know that having um, about you know three two to three months worth of um, living expenses tucked away can cushion the blow of any event and and we also know that things like having cash during a crisis so actual you know physical cash um, is a really you know useful kind of strategy in a way to be able to absorb some of the direct impacts because you um, don't have to worry about the fact that you can't get cash out of the ATM you've got you can turn that cash it's a convertible form of capital where you can turn it into food you can turn it into shelter you can turn it into labor to help clean up or whatever it might be so having some some things like that can help you absorb and create the shock absorber for some of these shocks of course the capacity to absorb gets overwhelmed at, and so we end up in this kind of we need to respond and you know we're very privileged and lucky in this country that we have the capacity to respond we have you know excellent emergency services we have an excellent health system and by and large you know those systems do a good job we know that at times they break down and communities as we've seen with the recent bushfires the scale the speed the remoteness all of those things challenge those their capacity the formal capacity to respond um, and that's where communities need to be have the capacity to respond themselves to step up and fill those gaps particularly in those sort of short terms after a major crisis then there's a period of recovery you know and that's a lot of communities and people joining us from these communities this morning are in that recovery mode now from bushfires we know there'll be a recovery period after covid and again you know we have we're in we have systems in place to help us recover uh, and we have mechanisms that can help us recover insurance is one um, but we also know that you know that recovery requires careful coordination and planning those sorts of things and thinking about before the event happens and that's why these critical resilience capacities thinking about them um, you know prior to the event is so critical so that we can plan uh, and be in that recovery mode as soon as possible and then this last category that i call renew and that's really about taking stock it's about learning it's about reflecting on what's happened it's about learning about what happened and how you can improve your capacity to anticipate absorb respond and recover but it's also a time to ask questions about what's our strategy going forward are we just going to rebuild in the same place are we going to you know try to you know plant the same crop on the floodplain and hope for a different outcome next time are we going to have you know increase our insurance are we going to go off um, and get some uh, you know more skills so that we've got a, a option in terms of off-farm income or um, are we going to um, think about our um, whole livelihood and think about whether maybe we should change uh, and do something else those capacities when they're implemented well and when they're thought about planned and implemented well have the capacity to to really impact on the recovery time and that's the that's the um, light green here is is a kind of the resilience path to recovery if you like i'll just make two quick points before i go on one is if you look see this little blue line popping up here at the bottom human systems social systems have the capacity to anticipate and they have the capacity to do reflection so you know as humans we have foresight we can we can see what's coming or we can anticipate what's coming and we can make decisions and we can also reflect afterwards and and um, make decisions about you know how we want to respond in the future social systems can do that but things ecological systems obviously don't have foresight they don't have intention um, infrastructure doesn't have foresight so some parts of the system obviously 
can't anticipate and some parts can't do that renewal in the same way as we as humans can do. And I just want to make that point that there's differences in how different parts of the system will function and how they'll recover. If we do this well, as I mentioned, we lower this curve and we've, we are, we're all familiar with flattening curves now and, and what that means. And that's what resilience is trying to do. It's trying to flatten this curve. We can't avoid many of the stresses and impacts that come along and impact on our communities, on us as individuals, on our business, on our region. We simply can't avoid them. We have to be able to be res build resilience towards them. And if we do that in these building these critical resilience capacities, we can sort of flatten this curve. As I said, we will never go back. You never go back to normal. You never go back to where you were simply by the fact that the system now has the legacy of this event in it. But we can um, shorten the tail, if you like, and, and reduce that tail of recovery and renewal. Um, and we can hopefully get back to similar levels, but you've always got the legacy, as I say, of that past event. So that's around these resilience capacities. <clears throat> then the last thing that's important to focus in on in terms of this definition is this idea about coping. And I'm not talking here about coping strategies in the way that we might think about it from a resilience point of view, um, uh, from a psychological resilience point of view, sorry, that we, you know, where we're talking about psychological coping capacities. I'm talking here about what I call as the kind of resilience um, coping strategy. And we think about this in three ways, that one strategy is to try and persist. So you might use those um, critical capacities that I just talked about, the ability to anticipate, absorb, et cetera. You might use those just to help you persist. You might use those to help you um, stay in essentially the same identity. So if you're a farmer, you might use those resilience capacities to just help you to keep farming and doing the same thing. So that might involve, you know, getting, say, um, you know, after a, a, a drought, you just restock to the same number of stock with the same, you know, type of stock and you run the same type of farming system. Moving into this middle category, this this strategy of adaptation, and, and I divide adaptation into two categories. One is what I'd call reinforcing adaptations. So they're things that you do. Um, yes, you adopt new technology or you adopt a new way of doing something, but it's still largely about maintaining that identity. So it's still largely about keeping your system operating um, in a relatively similar way, even though it's adjusting and adapting. So in the case of the farmer, again, they might buy some new technology. They might, you know, get a, a bigger tractor and a bigger bit of um, you know, gear for putting the crop in, uh, but it's still, they're still a farmer, they're still a cropper, um, and all they've done is is increased um, or use some technology to maybe, you know, find some efficiencies. It hasn't fundamentally changed their identity. And I would argue in a lot of cases, it hasn't fundamentally changed their resilience, their ability to cope. If they've borrowed more money um, to get that bigger machine, thinking that, well, if we've got a bigger machine, we'll be more efficient, but they've ex expose themselves financially to more risk. Um, overall, that strategy is not really one a re that's a, a long-term resilience strategy. They might be able to persist a bit longer, um, but overall, that's a, um, you know, a strategy that's um, maintaining their identity in the shorter term, but in the longer term, particularly if the system around it is changing um, in ways that they can't anticipate, then those sort of strategies might not take them where they want to go. There's also creative adaptations, and they're things that can help you to push towards um, a different kind of identity or start to form the basis of a different identity for, for that system. And so th that might be in the case of a farmer um, starting to um, develop a new product line on the property, um, growing something else, or it might be a value adding. It might be going off farm and getting some new skills that they can bring to add some value to something that they already do. So it's starting to shift the identity. So they're not just doing the same thing, only better. They're actually starting to do slightly different things or different things that are starting to take them in a new direction. And then, of course, right up the right hand end of this continuum, you have transformation. And that's where you're doing fundamentally different things. You're developing a new identity um, and creating a fundamentally new identity for the system. 
All of these strategies are valid. Sometimes they're valid in the same place at, a, at the same time in the same system. You'll have parts of the system that are trying to persist, bits that are adapting, bits that are trying to transform. And, and you know, it's this mix, if you like, of coping strategies um, and, and trying to work out which bits of the system can persist, which bits can adapt to the changes that are happening and which bits need to transform. It's one of the sort of most challenging parts of um, this resilience um, thinking and these sort of core ideas and applying them on ground. So bringing together those, oh, sorry, I'll just quickly go through a little quick case study where we we applied this kind of thinking. So this was with a small community in New South Wales, in Western New South Wales, um, middle of the drought, a community that is really suffering um, uh, it, there'd been some major changes in land use, uh, destocking, all sorts of things that had a very severe impact on the town. It, it had been sort of famous for having a number of shearing teams working out of that town um, and those shearing teams all disbanded and the, the town had really suffered. It, it, um, a number of businesses had closed in the town, a number of shops had closed, etc. The community had a community hall. This isn't the hall. Um, this is a, I don't have a photo of a hall, but it was a hall like this, uh, the typical kind of country hall. Very, it was very run down. The town had declined in population and it was aging. And they didn't have the energy, they didn't have the resources to do something with their with their hall. And they were really worried about the maintenance costs and the ongoing maintenance costs. So they applied to government for some some dollars to do something about the hall and they were lucky enough to get enough money to essentially rebuild the hall. And the question was asked though, what what's Sorry, the Paul, just, just interrupting. Yeah, interrupting. We can't the slide hasn't caught up to what you're talking about. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Oh well, that's interesting. So people imagine a hall. <laughs> yeah. You can just imagine an old hall. Uh, I'll just try and Oh it's moving oh, it's now. Something's happening. Okay. Imagine an old hall. It is coming. <laughs> Dilapidated old hall. Um, they they secured some funding to do something with this hall. But the question then was really, what should we be trying to build for the future, given the fact, the change that they could anticipate? Their population was declining and ageing. And so they they came up with a set of options. Um, I'm sorry we've got the time lag, but I've got these options up. Um, they they essentially had the option to patch up the hall. They could use those resources to patch up the hall. But that was really clearly a persistence strategy. That was just rebuilding, patching up the thing that's there and in the same format. Oh, there we go. Hopefully everyone's caught, that's caught up. They could patch up and renovate for the elderly users. And so one of the plans was to, you know, put in all the standard stuff, the ramps, the, you know, the got the handrails, all of that kind of stuff for the for the users that were the predominant users of the hall. But that was really a reinforcing adaptation. Essentially, it was just keeping the hall the same and reinforcing it for the same users, if you like. Another option was to go with a new design, but include other users. So that included, you know, maybe having facilities for um, the school down the road and, and that sort of thing. And then the final, um, but, and that's the kind of, was an adaptation that's more creative. They were starting to look at, well, what are some other options here? And then finally, the, there was this option for a new design, but um, in a modular format that they could add to or take away bits of the building and that it was transportable. And they actually had the plan that if, if the town continued to decline the way it was, that they would actually sell off bits of the hall. So, and that's actually the model that they went for. I, to be honest, I actually don't know whether it got built. So the plan was made and they were going off to, to get the plans drawn up, et cetera. I haven't been back to see what was built in the end, but the plan was to have a modular building that, could incorporate a range of other users and that it was transportable so that if the maintenance became too great for this community, if the population continued to decline the way it was, 
that they could actually just sell off bits of the building. Uh, and so their long term strategy was, in my mind, quite a, a resilient one. OK. So. I want to try and bring together these these sort of four elements that I've talked about. So the first. Um, the, the four bits that we've just talked about that in that definition, and as I said, I, I continue. I've been doing this for a long time as a resilience you know, practitioner and thinker, and I go back to that definition again and again, and I would suggest for you um, people interested, if you're interested in it for you, use that definition as a sort of core idea and keep that with you um, because you can go back to it and help to think about the, the challenges that you're trying to think about. So we talked about a systems view, uh, developing a systems view, thinking about that idea of the kind of fabric, the underlying fabric. Don't get distracted by the pattern and the colours on top, that's important, but it's the underlying system structure, the fabric underneath that's important. We talked about different modes of system change, things that, things that we can anticipate and and things that are harder to anticipate. And we talked about things that, you know, destroy uh, and are destructive on the, the things we value and things that um, there may be opportunities in. We talked about those resilience capacities, these critical capacities to deal with stress. And we talked about these coping strategies uh, and the sort of tactics, if you like, around persistence, um, adaptation through to transformation. There's, there's another element which I haven't touched on and I'll, I'll go into this next week, is the idea of um, resilient design principles. So as a fail safe, given that um, you know, we don't know how systems will change, that our capacities, those critical capacities get overrun um, or that um, uh, you know, we don't have the right coping strategy, is that we can also use a set of a set of critical uh, a set of resilient design principles to help us to be like a catch-all if you like to for our thinking and for our design and for our work to have a set of principles that that these underlying kind of principles that will help to um, backstop uh, the rest of the things above there if we can bring all that together that's resilience thinking management and practice and and you know it sounds like a lot there's a lot there, there's a lot to dig into, but all of those pieces, uh, each of them has tools associated with it and we have the principles that I'll give to you next week. Um, bringing that together into a process can help you to think about resilience, can help you to manage resilience and can help you to put resilience into practice. Okay, that's a lot. I realise I just threw a lot at you, but we've got some time for questions now. Um, if, as we mentioned before, if you, if you can, do it through the chat, you can do that. If you can't do it through the chat, um, by all means, just uh, yell out, but um, we'll see how we go. So, we I just got a question via email from Laura, whether she could send, the, uh, share the videos um, uh, with her local community. The answer is definitely. Um, we're putting the recordings on the GB. CMA website. So I've just put the link there, but you would have had it in emails from me as well. So yeah, share this with um, all your contacts. And just for people wanting to participate live, they just still need to register. We have got a cap um, on the number of people that we can um, allow to participate um, live, but we've still got room for many more. So. Um, Helen, good good question about is there a local community of practice? There's there's not really a local community of practice. We've had um, we've been running a community of practice, a national community of practice, which has mostly been for agency people. Not many community people have been part of that. Having said that, it's morphing, and we've got um, pilot projects running in New South Wales, and we're going to be starting some pilot projects here in Victoria with community level. Um, less agency people and more community people. And the aim is for that community of practice now to sort of morph into supporting more the community level um, people. So it doesn't exist right at the moment, uh, um, or it exists, but not in the right format at the moment. Um, and what we'll do is transition it to this kind of community um, based community of practice uh, over the next year or so. 
Any other comments or questions? Anything else people would like to to bring up or discuss? We'll we'll send around the link again for the for the survey shortly, and it'd be great again if people could do that survey before. Um, particularly if you could do it today, uh, that would be fantastic because we um, will use that to inform our um, thinking for next week, and we'll also send out the the feedback to people. Yeah, just remember, Alfred. If really people have questions um, for the online, just to unmute yourself if you're if you're not using chat. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Um, good, good question, Alfred. About or good comment about you know the the single component of the system is you know we can think about it. We can just hone in on one part of the system, but we really need this kind of scenarios to think about the whole system. And, and work with a, a kind of a more holistic view and think about how social, economic, environmental are interacting. It's very easy to get captured by um, the event. And I'll talk about that next week, a little bit about, you know, the fact that a lot of our thinking gets focused on the event. And um, one of the points I wanna stress, and I'll, I'll do this more as we go through over the next few weeks, is we're never dealing with a single event. Every community, every business, every farm, uh, every local community is dealing, always dealing with layers of events. It, there's always the recovery. You're always in recovery from something uh, and you're always experiencing something new. And so look at, you know, the bushfires and COVID, look at economic downturns, look at, you know, price collapses in some of our industries. Look at you know trade deals and and all sorts of things that create these layers of dynamics, and you're never dealing with just the single event. So I I couldn't agree more. The challenge I think is to find the right scenarios scenario process to use, and it's often challenging. But we can talk about that another time, Alfred. Any other comments or questions from people? You can see the the link to the um, survey there. If you have got you know any comments that you want to make or any particular content that you want to cover or recover, um, happy to to do that in detail. Um, if you put that into the survey, we can cover things in more detail next week. Um, uh, Angus, good good question. So there's there's a massive body of of work out there around resilience and we've been working with um i'm not sure if you were part of the, the thing last week but you know i've got a background in working with different um groups international groups and organizations that work on this so you know i pull what works out of those out of the theory but we've also honed our own set of ideas and concepts over the last 15 or so years so we've done about 800 days of workshops and working with communities. And out of that, I've just tried to distill down so that the stuff I talked about today really is the distillation of, of that about, you know, you need to understand systems and you need to have a system lens. You need to think about how the system changes. And those two things are related, obviously, um, but uh, but they're, they're slightly different. So you need to think about the system and how, how it works. You need to think about how it changes. You need to think about the capacities you've got to deal with with change, you know, to absorb, adapt, etc. And you've got to have a strategy. You've got to have a coping strategy. What's your approach? Are you trying to just persist, adapt, etc.? That to me is the distillation of a lot of work, the guts of of resilience thinking. If we can get that right, um, we can go a long way. Um, good, really good question. Ash around uh, from Laura there about you know can these models be used in a creative um, a creative way? Um, it's easy to get caught on the negatives, and it's because we can get caught up in responding to the events, and and we have to respond to those, Laura. We we absolutely have to respond. You know we all know and agree on this that we have to help people recover, we have to help communities that are in trouble. The creative side, I think, is is fundamental in helping people to see a different future. And 
even at the most basic level, the reason that that's important is when you're in that fear mode um, from an, an event, the stress mode, um, whether that's in anticipation or recovery, your brain over, you know, m millennia, our brains have developed to do us a favour, which is to shut down creativity. They shut down options. And, you know, anyone that's been in a workshop with me has probably heard me say this. It's an old kind of joke, but it's true, which is if you think about two groups of people in Africa kind of, you know, walking through the long grass, our ancestors, as they were walking out of Africa and evolving, and those two groups, they hear some lions roar, which group do you think survives? The one that just runs away or the one that sits down and does the scenario planning process and thinks about all of the options and goes through a kind of, you know, elaborate process? Of course, the quick decision, the fight or flight is the, is the evolutionary survival mechanism. So when we're under stress, in any period of stress, our body does us a favour, our brain does us a favour, it shuts down the options that are available and it, it limits our creativity. Um, that means we often get poor, we make poor decisions under stress and that happens at the individual level, but I think it happens at the society level as well. Creativity is absolutely fundamental in creating hope and and options for the future and so we need creativity we need the arts we need people to be um, inspired to be stimulated to think differently and to think creatively about the future um, and it, it it creates hope and when you have hope you actually get more creative and when you have hope you get motivation and so creativity and the arts i think are absolutely fundamental in helping us move in that from that circle that I mentioned um, where we're focused on destructive and anticipated to more um, thinking about more creative and and to think about you know the range of things that could happen in the future and going back to Alfred's point above about scenarios you know thinking creatively about the range of possible futures that we could have and the opportunities that we might create using the arts is absolutely fundamental to doing that. So I really agree, Laura. And it's one of the areas that's really weak in resilience work is to actually um, know how to use creativity in the arts to stimulate people's imagination and to stimulate their hope, et cetera. But it's something that, you know, we're interested in exploring and a number of people around the world are exploring. So. Okay, so I'm conscious we're, we're a little bit over time. We, we can hang around here for up until about 11 o'clock. So if people want to stay online and, you know, happy now for it to be a bit less formal, if you if you want to jump in, if you've got a, just a comment or question, if you want to use your audio, that's fine. Um, just, just quickly, what will happen next week um, is we'll focus in on these resilience principles. As I mentioned, they're kind of a backstop and something that can underpin um, and I'd also, I want to touch on some of the tools and things that we, we use and we'll go more into that next week. And in week four, we'll essentially focus on the tools, um, that, are, we use around those four blocks of things that I mentioned at the end, you know, the capacity to think about systems that the, um, uh, the way systems change, those critical capacities that we use and, um, our coping strategies. We'll talk about some tools for all of those that we can use. Okay, so um, I'll hang around here for another few minutes. Otherwise, if you could please do the survey. Thanks for joining us and hopefully we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. Hey, Paul. Hey, Paul. Yeah. Hey, Kirsty. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, Kirsty. Um, how are you? Great session. Thanks, mate. Um, I was interested to hear your discussion on that creative aspect of, um, you know, bringing, bouncing forward, I suppose. And I was wondering, has there been any work done on how, um, whether or not really creative communities already are more resilient? Excellent question. Um, I, I don't think it's been quantified, you know, I don't think you could say anywhere that because we can be resilient to some things and not to others. So even highly creative communities 
who might be very resilient and very creative and coming up with options can still get knocked over. So, you know, being more creative um, helps and probably helps. And and if, and I, if I was asked, you know, should we try and be more creative to build our resilience? I would say yes. Will that guarantee that you're resilient to all of the stresses and shocks that might come along? No. You yeah, know, I just yeah. wondered in terms of the curve that you did through earlier, whether yeah. you're more likely to be in that greener curve rather than blue. Yeah. Anyway, it's just a, it's just a, a pondering. No, good, really good question. There is some evidence that, that those communities can recover quicker and there's some evidence that communities that are more creative can generate more options and ideas and yeah. they're, they're always yeah. going to be good things. So I, I would say, you know, <laughs> if... Um, I get that there's no blanket rule. At time. Yeah, but if the option is there, I would go. I would. I would think you know, build creativity is a useful strategy. Thanks. Um, Paul, some people that can't see the. They can't see the chat function at all when they can't use it. So um, there's a little bit of confusion over um, your response to Alfred's point. Um, oh. I'll just read out what Alfred said. That might help clear it up. Um, yeah, yeah. So Alfred was, um, your point was stress testing is like a fire drill, um, but this is for a single component system, whereas future scenario testing is a multi-component approach. So Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so... I mean, I hope that was clear enough. What Alfred's point is that we can think about the, that kind of curve for a single event, but when you're talking about multiple events or multiple um, dimensions, if you like, of things happening, um, that you you need to use some kind of scenarios sort of process where you bring together and think about how can the, how would the system respond to multiple things happening at once, um, and you know, we've seen that at the moment with the bushfire recovery and the and COVID that, um, you know, it's, um, it's testing our ability to cope with these multiple things. So it's it's all well and good to think about that curve in relation to one um, one stress, but what do you do when you've got multiple stresses? So, yeah, yeah. good point. Okay, Rod. Um, so for people that can't read it, Rob McLennan over in Shep, uh, he's got a long history of working in the, the Golden Broken CMA and working with the Golden Broken CMA. Um, to adapt creatively means breaking the strong psychological nexus between the person and what is or has been owned, what the soul or pocket has invested in. I wonder if it is about making people more psychologically minimalist what you own ends up owning you. That's very deep, Rob. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I'm more and more interested in in how our bias, our inbuilt, you know, biases that all humans have drive our decision making and and that need to protect what we own. So, you know, there's a bias that we we um, we value keeping what we've got. Um, and minimising losses, we value minimising losses more than getting gains. And so that can lock us into that persistence mode. And I think we see that a lot. I think, you know, particularly in rural communities that are conservative, struggling to cope with a lot of change, um, older farmers, for example, you see that where they'll just hang on rather than adopting, you know, new practices or whatever. And, and um, there's fear, there's there's all sorts of things start to play into it, but some are just these kind of inbuilt biases that people have, and we don't even know that they're, they're there, um, and it's worth spending some time trying to tease some of those sorts of things out and, and seeing which things are actually limiting people's ability to, to be resilient or to make changes. And there's no doubt that psychological level is um, is absolutely critical. Okay, so um, I think we're nearly done. Doesn't seem to uh, be many questions. I had one 
Oh, Alfred, yeah. Yeah, yeah I had one thing. Uh, we had a big futures project here in the region uh, about 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, with yeah. QJ. And uh, that was a very extensive scenario planning project with a lot of people involved. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, a lot of people have forgotten about it, but some some of those scenarios have actually developed quite quite realistically. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So it's just something that we should uh, that we are looking back at again. Yeah. Go over again. It is Alfred, and um, there's been a bit of work. Alfred. Um, there's been a bit of work just recently, Alfred, on looking at resilience of the Gold Murray Irrigation District, and part of that work was to go back and look at that futures work, and and it was it was unbelievably accurate. I mean, it 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 um, predicted you know a range of things that have happened or anticipated a range of things that happened under those different scenarios. Um, the failure of it was that we didn't pick it up and use it. The, 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 you know, we, we sort of ignored, we did all the thinking, but we didn't turn it into practice. And for lots of reasons, no, no, that's not a criticism of the individuals or anyone involved, but we kind of just moved on too quickly rather than really learning the lessons from that extensive piece of work. So we, we've been looking at that in detail and saying, why didn't this result in the change that was needed? Um, and there's some really interesting things about the institutions and governments and and society, the way we moved on quickly from that, when we could have really learnt from that and we wouldn't be suffering some of the challenges that we're suffering now if we'd actually put in place a number of the recommendations of that work. It's a good lesson. Yeah. Okay, any other comments or questions just before we wrap up? Thanks again, Paul from um, Golden Broke and CMA for working with us on this. And yeah, I think I haven't got any more on email, so yeah, we might be able to wrap up. We'll call it quits there. Hopefully we'll see you or hear from you again next week. Thanks for joining us.